Beneath vast mountains, across open moorland, and alongside shimmering lochs, Scotland's railways travel a landscape like no other. From coastal towns to historic cities. Trains bring passengers to some of Britain's most iconic landmarks. For the crews on board the trains... If you do get a couple of minutes, it's good just to have a wee look out. For the engineers safeguarding the track... We are under no illusion. You get at the top of this thing, it's scary. And for the volunteers keeping Scotland's steam heritage alive... It's a unique thing. You know, it's not just, you know, press a button and it goes. It's part of the joy of working on the world's most beautiful railway. Highland journey touched by magic. I mean, I've been travelling up and down here for 30 odd years now, and it's just the most beautiful job ever. I love it. A bird's eye view of a railway black spot. The danger to trains here is that if we let the geometry of the track deteriorate to such an extent, you start to create a derailment risk. And a whistle stop tour to the most remote railway station in the UK. Incredible that this little station exists in the middle of this vast landscape. On the West Highland Line, the Malig extension runs from Fort William to the coastal town of Malig. On the way, it cuts and climbs through some of Scotland's most awe-inspiring and diverse terrain. When this 41-mile line was completed in 1901, it connected Sleepy Malig with the rest of the country, transforming the town into a busy and bustling fishing port. But these days, the special trains leaving Malig stacked with freshly caught herring are long gone. Instead, it's eager tourists who cram into these carriages to travel the line. 28F, and your time. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks, have a good day. Every summer, the Jacobite runs two return journeys a day. From Fort William, it runs along the shores of Loch Heal before crossing the Glenfinnan Viaduct. After winding its way through the hills and skirting Loch Heal, it cuts a path north, hugging the coast all the way to Malik. You just go straight to carriage C, which is the next carriage along from here, oh. and it's seat number 7 and 8B. Okay, okay. thank you very much. One of the most well-known faces on board is Florence, <whistles> who's been the Jacobite's guard for the past 24 years. West Coast Railway Company would like to welcome you aboard this 1015 steam service to Mali. The scenery is just amazing. I've been coming up and down here now for all these number of years, and there's some days where it just takes your breath away, just with the different lights and shadows. The people, obviously, you know, you get some people coming back year after year, so that's good to see them. And it's just the best job in the world. I just absolutely love it. For Florence, working on the Jacobite is a family affair. My son Lewis, he also works in the railway. He is a guard and fireman. As a baby, he would come on with me. And, you know, the school holidays, he would come on, he would go and run up down to and collect on the rubbish for the girls in the buffet. And so he really, he was never going to do anything else. Having given so much of her life to the Jacobite, Florence was recently honoured with a special gift. The first class coach was named Florence, and that was a birthday present for my 50th birthday. Uh, so it was a surprise. You all work as a team, and we enjoy it. So obviously that shines through, I hope that shines through, because we're all sort of quite happy and enjoy our work. Seventy thousand passengers ride the Jacobite every summer. 
And it's not just the magical scenery they come for. I'm here with my girls and they're big Harry Potter fans. Like, I kind of feel like I'm in the movie. Too. Ever since the Hogwarts Express first steamed across the Glenfinnan Viaduct, Harry Potter fans from all over the world have descended on this pretty pocket of the Highlands to jump aboard the Jacobite. And now for our Harry Potter fans. At 1,200 feet long and 100 feet high, the elegantly curved 21-arch viaduct is a star attraction in its own right. Done my research, I had a look at quite a few of the travel books, so I knew to sit on the left hand side <laughs> um, to get a better views and the, and the chance of the photographs of the train going over Glenfin and Viaduct as it curled round. It was great, yeah, it was really cool to, to drive over and see the beautiful view. Most people come on for the viaduct and it is, it's spectacular, it's absolutely amazing. I always say, you know, just wait till after Glenfin and it gets better, honestly. First, a pit stop. The Jacobite waits at Glenfinnan Station for 30 minutes each way, offering travellers a chance to stretch their legs. It also gives Florence a chance to catch up with her son Lewis and the engine driver John. <laughs> this is where we get away from the madding crowd, you see, a bit of relaxation. It's been a very, very strenuous day so far. <laughs> you don't know the meaning of the word, John. <laughs> Lewis, young lad, he's just started. He's picking up good habits. He's a very, 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 very good fireman. Yeah, I'm only here to shovel coal. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> so the tri driver's in charge of the engine and the guard's in charge of the train and the passengers. So the driver does what the guard says. <laughs> Having my mum in the train is um, challenging <laughs> uh, at the best of times. It's all right, I suppose. Yeah, she, she, she does a good job. <laughs> With one more round trip to squeeze in today, tea break is over. Euston Station, London. 120,000 people come through here every day making it the busiest intercity passenger terminal in Britain. It's been the London hub for travellers to the Midlands and the north of England for nearly 200 years. And in 1873, the country's first official sleeper service left this station attached to a mail train bound for Scotland. So this is gonna be coach E. So this is going to Fort William this evening. These days, conditions for overnight passengers on the Caledonian Sleeper offer a little more luxury. This is one of our club rooms. So we just check that the toiletries have all been set up right and that the correct breakfast cards are on the bed, which they are. The air condition is working nice and... It's nice and cool in here. Two sleeper trains depart Euston every night bound for Scotland. So we're going to open the doors now, ready for the guests to come on board. And Ricky runs the hospitality team on board. Tonight we've got a fully booked train and we'll be boarding the guests at 8.30 and then we'll be serving meals and drinks in the club car, giving the guests their nightcaps before they go to bed, maybe one, two o'clock, who knows, in the morning, and then making sure that they get up, have their breakfast and are off the train at their right stations in the morning. I'm thinking cheese board. I'm thinking haggis. I'm thinking cheese board. I really hope they have some haggis I'm thinking head straight for the dining car. OK. Two of the guests boarding this evening are no strangers to the Caledonian sleeper. Which platform is it? Uh, should be platform one. Longest platform at Euston. 16 carriage train, longest train. Should we go? Got to be platform one. Let's do it. Married couple Jeff and Vicky recently became a YouTube sensation with their online documentary, All the Stations. We are at Penzance Station. And we're going... To all the stations. 2,563 stations. Mm -hmm. 
Let's do it. Video diaries of their adventures get hundreds of thousands of views online. We want to uh, do a trip in 24 hours, so we're catching the sleeper. We're going to spend the day tomorrow in Karawa, and then we're going to catch the sleeper back uh, again tomorrow night. To the Highlands. <laughs> yes? Yes. The 16 carriage sleeper departs Euston at 9.15 pm and arrives at Edinburgh Waverley at quarter to four. There, it splits, with six carriages continuing on to Inverness, five to Fort William, and five to Aberdeen. Jeff and Vicky are taking the Fort William branch, getting off at Carrower in the heart of the Highlands. Shotgun, top bunk. No, I want the top. So you've, you've got breakfast card on your bed there, so Lovely. if you'd like to order tea, coffee, or juice for the morning. Yep. Are you coming down to join us for a nightcap or very something to much, eat? Very okay. much. Okay. So. Just five coaches down, you'll We're find on the lounge bar. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, I'll see you down there. Thank you, Ricky. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. I'm preparing a cheese board um, for an. I'm going to do a chocolate tour as well. Uh, we serve all night on the super. Yeah. For as long as the passengers can go, we can go. There can be a party atmosphere. It depends on the night. And tonight could be one of those nights. Barely five minutes out of Euston, the lounge bar is already standing room only. There's a lot of camaraderie amongst the Fort Williams. They all know each other. So you quite often find different sets of guests will know each other from previous journeys and they'll all sort of sit together and have fun, I suppose. It leaves Euston at quarter past nine, it trundles into Rannoch at quarter to eight in the morning, and it's an absolutely beautiful location. You know, it's right in the middle of the mountains, the, the moors, the lochs and everything, and it's absolutely wonderful. You know, I've never slept in a sleeper before, so um, it's quite exciting, really. As long as my husband doesn't snore, he'll be all right. Can I have some of your hangers? Sure. Thanks. From the guest's perspective, I think it must be amazing to fall asleep in dreary London where it's all grey and raining, and then you wake up in the, the West Highlands, which is beautiful. The service is due into Carrara Station at 8.58, where Jeff and Vicky will begin the next stage of their adventure. So wake up call for you in the morning? Seven, yeah, it's 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, seven. yeah. With an action-packed day ahead, it's probably a good thing they've decided to call it a night. Have a lovely evening. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you ready? After you. Let's do it. Oh, I think it went really well. A load of happy guests off to their beds, full of whiskey and haggis. Good night, everyone. Two thousand three hundred trains a day crisscross Scotland, travelling on some two thousand eight hundred kilometres of track, and from windswept coasts to the wild highlands, every last inch of the line is monitored and maintained by Network Rail's army of expert engineers. At Cumbernauld Airport, aerial survey specialist Sean Lay. Hey guys, Stuart is getting ready to take flight with geotech engineer Stuart Jameson. Two straps over the top. Yeah. So the, the objective for today is to get aerial imagery, to, to pick up any new defects, to look at some of the defects we already know about, and to look for any deterioration, anything that may be a cause um, of concern. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. I've probably flown this line 60, 70 times and it changes every day. It's just like flying through the Garden of Scotland. It's absolutely beautiful. Today they're on the trail of the West Highland Line. Camera system on. Built over a period of four years in the late 1800s, at a cost of just over half a million pounds, this world-famous railway cuts through a landscape of breathtaking beauty. We're in the, the wild highlands of Scotland, uh, in amongst the hills of the Trossachs, 
and the mountains. It is just a beautiful part of the world. So we've got Loch Omens just down behind you and the railway uh, is just over over that hill line you can see on the on the west banks of Loch Lomond. Loch Lomond is a 22 mile long freshwater lake and is often seen as the boundary between the lowlands of central Scotland and the highlands. From its northern shore, the West Highland Line splits in two, with one branch continuing north to Fort William and on to Malik, and another forking west to Oban. Today, Stuart wants to survey the mountainous western stretch along the Oban Line. There's lots of loose boulders uh, in and around these trees and above, and because the hillsides are very steep, uh, they can actually make their way down the hillside towards the railway and, and cause us problems. Falling rocks and boulders don't just damage the tracks. If they come to rest on the line, they can derail a train. You can just see the volume of, of rock material sitting on the hillside itself, all of which could potentially become dislodged at some point. So aerial surveys to look for any sort of recent defects or movement is something that, that has high value to us. In 2010, a two-car passenger service was derailed on this line after striking a boulder that had fallen onto the track. Fortunately, none of the 64 passengers or three crew members on board were seriously hurt. It's not just boulders on the slopes that Stuart needs to keep an eye on. The rock beneath the track is also cause for concern. This is Sean, yeah, that's it there, yep. That's a big lump of rock, isn't it? Just that whole area you're, you're focused in on yeah. now, that, that's the area that we're experiencing a lot of movement. The rock is just slowly Real sliding movement. down the hillside, very slowly, but over time that can cause boys to open up underneath the track and we basically lose the ballast and that creates a hole in the track. We've got monitoring systems on individual blocks, large blocks that have the potential to topple and actually obstruct the track. These sensors act as the geotech team's eyes and ears on the ground, and they require regular review. So the next job for Stuart and the team is to get back to track level. At Edinburgh's Waverley Station, a thousand trains arrive or depart each day from all corners of the UK. With an average of 70,000 travellers passing through these platforms every 24 hours, customer services assistant Maggie has to be on her toes. I love coming into my work because you never know what you're going to be presented with. It could be from disruption to somebody looking for lost property. Then we get you know, passengers that have never even been into the Waverley station. So it's making them feel at ease when you're actually taking them to where they need to be. Maggie's just received a call from the mobility assistance team. They need her to help a passenger due into Waverley this morning. We're just meeting a gentleman off the train. He's a visually impaired passenger, so we're just going to find out where he's needing assistance to. Hello, it's Maggie. Hiya. Hello, how you doing? Big step down. Thank you. Smashing, okay. thanks. Yeah. So where are we off to oh, today then? Uh, well, if you could take me to the atrium, please. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be... I want to go up to Princess Street. Absolutely, but, um... absolutely. OK, okay. forward. Paul is a regular traveller through Waverley Station. As his sight has deteriorated gradually over the past 20 years, train travel has become his lifeline. Paul is just one of 350,000 registered blind people in the UK, the majority of whom rely on public transport to get around. Well, here we are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have a good day. Yeah, and, and we'll see you on the next one. Again. Cheers. OK, and find the step. Good boy. Forward. It was lovely to see him again. It's amazing that he can find um, that independence again. And, you know, with, with the guide dogs, it's, it just goes to show you how important they really are. And then find the step. I started using trains more and more when Roscoe and I sort of uh, became a team. 
Roscoe is liberating me, allowing me to do things that I want to do. And the assistance to making sure I get to the right seat, um, making sure I'm on the right train, um, and meeting me off the trains as well, that's equally important. Roscoe makes everything feel normal, which it is, of course. Roscoe is one of 5,000 guide dogs in the UK helping visually impaired people to lead a more mobile lifestyle. But learning how to cope with the hustle and bustle of a busy station like Waverley... Morning, everyone. ..is something guide dogs must be taught from a very young age. We're going to get the 10.13 train from here into Waverley um, and then we'll do some training with the puppies in Waverley station. At New Craig Hall Station, puppy training supervisor Roisin Milner is assembling a new batch of recruits. Train travel is essential for the guide dog puppies um, because they are going on hopefully to work for somebody who is visually impaired. So car transport is not an option unless they're a passenger. So they are going to be using trains, buses, trams. We want them to come here and be totally comfortable with the noise. It can be a very frightening place at a station. Um, trains whizzing past and we want them to be comfortable getting on the train and finding the guide dog owner a seat. For the first 12 to 15 months of their life, guide dogs are raised by volunteers called puppy walkers. It's their job to help socialise the dogs, getting them used to the sights and sounds of the world around them. Labrador retriever Flora is 16 months old. Well, on Tuesday she goes on to the next bit for training, so she'll be leaving us. Which will be really hard, because we love her so much, and you know, we worry that nobody will love her as much as we do. Flora has just one more session with her walker, Helen, before she flies the nest. Next stop, Edinburgh Waverley. It's 7.15am, and having left London Euston just 10 hours ago, guests on the Caledonian Sleeper have woken to a breathtaking landscape. You go to sleep in London and it's dark, and then there's that beautiful moment when you raise the window blind and it's like, ah, oh, mountains, locks, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> and the railways in Britain just take you to these incredible places that you can, some places like Corral that we're going to today that you just otherwise wouldn't be able to get to. The magic of sort of falling asleep and waking up somewhere new, it's just fantastic. Railway adventurers Jeff and Vicky have visited every station in the UK, all 2,567 of them. Mountains. Look at that. <laughs> but the station at Carrower, where they're heading this morning, is one of their favourites. Next to the station is the station house, and it has a restaurant and cafe. And because we'd enjoyed it so much, we actually came back for our honeymoon when we got married. It's just a really beautiful place, so, yeah, it's, it's quite a special location for us. Just before 9am, tiny Carrower Station appears on the horizon against an immense backdrop of wild and unforgiving terrain. At 408 metres above sea level, it's officially the highest and most remote station in the UK. Isn't that just amazing how quietly it kind of rolls out? We've been here a, a few times now. This is the third, fourth, Four, fifth time? Fourth time. And it's just incredible that this little station exists in the middle of this vast landscape. Sadly, the mist is quite low today, but it doesn't matter because it's still always, it's always still, still beautiful. In 1996, this station gained worldwide notoriety when it featured in the film Train Spotting. But that's not why Jeff and Vicky are here today. The thing is, right? Right. If you were building a railway today, <laughs> yes. Would you look at a map of Scotland and the mountains? I know. I'll and, put it right and go, here. Let's just build it there. They've come to meet local historian Colin Clark. The man. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Hi. Colin. Hi, Vicky. Hi. Nice 
to meet Hello, you. Hello, Jeff. How Good do you do? You. Hello. Good. Good. What a marvellous place. When this remote stretch of the West Highland Line was first proposed in the early 1890s, a seven-man team was sent up to try and plot the 41-mile route. They set off in, in January, managed to get a rowing boat, and the seven piled into the rowing boat, and they proceeded to row up the loch. Now, it was about seven miles from the end of the loch to this end of the loch, and it was raining, it was blowing a gale. When we were getting halfway up the loch, the boat was leaking. They got up this end here, it was pitch black, they crashed in the side of the loch. The men were rescued from the loch by locals, who put them up for the night in a nearby lodge. So that was the start of the adventure. Wow. Yeah. Perhaps not the best of starts, <laughs> uh, no. but at least they got this far, yeah, which is yeah. always good. The expedition party included Robert McAlpine, who would become an engineering pioneer, but at that time was building his first railway in the south of Scotland. At first light, McAlpine and his compatriots set off again. So they would have walked on this exact track? They'd have walked on this exact track, yeah, 130 years ago, and then here they were. But dressed in tweed and travelling in winter, the expedition team were ill-prepared for the treacherous conditions as the weather turned against them. If you're going for mile after mile after mile over there, well, it's quite tiring on your legs. Yeah. Definitely. Now, the ground's wet, it's splodgy, you're splashing along, you're walking in tufts, you're jumping from tuft to tuft. After another mile and a half, it was clear. They weren't going to make it. They were struggling, really badly, badly struggling. Yeah. And the first man went down, and he fell and just couldn't get back up. He was oh. unconscious, he was right, he couldn't go in any further. Undeterred, the hardy McAlpine and a colleague powered on across the boggy moor in search of help, leaving the others behind. Incredibly, the men stumbled across two shepherds who immediately set out to look for McAlpine's injured colleagues. And they found them, which is a bit of a minor miracle. So with a bit of whiskey in the lips of the <laughs> unconscious man, they managed to, to get him to sort of semi-consciousness and on his feet. They, they revived him with a, a dram of whiskey. <laughs> I love it. A couple of drams. <laughs> this is why I say we should always carry the, whiskey. Yeah, the, <laughs> please tell me this was a happy ending and they survived. Everyone, everyone, well, I should, I should probably, survived. I should probably have started the story to say they all survived, yeah. which, which made it a good story. <laughs> but in the end, it was obviously worthwhile because the first sod was cut for that new railway in October of that same year. Despite their brush with death, McAlpine would play no part in the building of the line here. Instead, the job was given to London-based engineers, Lucas and Aird. Not to be outdone, McAlpine's response was to construct a railway unlike anything the world had seen before. The 41-mile Malig Extension. Featuring six spectacular viaducts made from reinforced concrete, pioneered by Robert McAlpine, which earned him the nickname Concrete Bob. 120 years on, it remains a masterpiece of railway engineering. The Jacobite Steam Service runs two trips a day back and forth between Fort William and Malley. It's backbreaking work for the firemen, who shovel around three and a half tons of coal on each round trip. But veteran engine driver John Hunt relishes the challenge. It's a tricky line, there's a lot of climbing, some steep gradients up, some steep gradients down. You've always got to be on our lookout, You've always got to be prepared for the unexpected. John's been working the footplate of steam locomotives for nearly 50 years and has become something of a local celebrity to rail enthusiasts. Well, it's a privilege to get paid to do something you enjoy, and not many people can say that. It's a challenge every day, there's no two days the same. But the scenery is always there, and it's beautiful scenery, and it's a pleasure to do the job. Set in back. The Jacobite service is run by West Coast Railways, the largest operator of steam trains in Britain. Commercial manager James Shuttleworth helped bring the Jacobite here in the 1990s. Piper, here. Up. Good luck. The service is called the Jacobite because we took over in 1995, which was the 250th anniversary of the Jacobite um, uprising at Glenfinnan, which is an integral part of the journey, Glenfinnan. 
the route has been described as one of the great railway journeys of the world. So we're not going to argue with that. <laughs> as with others who work on the Jacobite, steam is James's passion as well as his nine to five. He's an avid railway photographer, and today he's hoping to capture the locomotive against its most iconic backdrop. I'm very lucky to be able to combine an interest in railways with the job. But I don't pretend to be a particularly dynamic photographer, but it is nice that you get the opportunities to do it, and this certainly gives me the opportunity whenever possible. James isn't the only one who's come to witness this magical moment. Glenfinnan is one of the key shots on the line that people like to come to, but I think this has got rather more to do with um, Harry Potter. In the early days of when we were running the Jacobite, I, if I'd come up here, I might be the only person here. Um, I can see probably 50 or 60 people here today, which is quite extraordinary. The viaduct is absolutely gorgeous. The scenery around it is fabulous. Blown away, it's amazing. Yeah. It's so beautiful. It's just even more beautiful than we thought it was going to be. Oh, it's stunning. Just the surrounds, you don't even think about like the mountains behind it. You just, mm. yeah, you could stand here and just really take it all in. Gentlemen, we will shortly be crossing the Glenfinnan Viaduct. Glenfinnan Viaduct coming up shortly. Right on cue, the sun pierces the clouds and shines down on the Jacobite. It's always nice to see. And everybody waving to each other as well is always good. There's probably as many people out in the hills taking photographs of us coming over as there is on the train. It's so exciting to come see the Jacobite crossing the bridge. Is it the Jacobite or is it the Hogwarts Express? Who was on it? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> As the crowds disperse, James is keen to share his morning's work with driver John, who he recently collaborated with on a book of photography celebrating the beauty and history of the West Highland Line. Well, that was all right in the bar, that, wasn't it? It was all right for you. Yes. Do you want to have a look and see my uh, yeah, humble John, effort, see what you see think what of that? Your master shot, yeah. Oh, we just got that right, didn't we? We did. I just opened up when the sun came out for a brief moment, you know. Marvellous, well done. Volume two? Yes, yes, I'm very tall, James. Yes, well done. After two return trips, today's service is coming to a close. But tomorrow morning at 10.15 sharp, the Jacobite will be back on the line. For those who work this route every day and have fallen under its spell, it's a journey that continues to work its magic. I mean, I've been travelling up and down here for 30 odd years now, and every day it's different. I mean, you come out of the tunnels and you look back, it's just stunning. And the water can be green, it can be blue, it's just beautiful. Just the most beautiful job ever. I love it. Puppy training supervisor Rasheen Milner is travelling into Edinburgh Waverley with five guide dog puppies and their walkers. She wants to get them used to the hustle and bustle of a busy station. Here's a good girl. This is Edinburgh Waverley, final stop. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. Every year, up to 1,500 guide dogs are trained in the UK. These one-year-old puppies have nearly completed the first stage of their training. Oh, you're clever, girl. Right, Cobbs, lead the way, mate. Steady, good boy. It's Rasheen's job to help transform them from excitable puppies to guide dogs in waiting. We want them to ignore the pigeon and just go straight on. It's fine to look, but no lunging. Excellent. We're actually on the lookout for pigeons or any other distractions. Um, and it's just the dogs are taking in the moving things, the unusual objects, the sound of the tannoids just getting them used to this environment. As you can see, they're all quite calm and relaxed. 
Um, what the good thing we have about the station is there's various stairs. What we're looking for here is for the dogs to indicate the step to show that there is an incline. And we want them to walk up the stairs nice and steadily and then them to come down the stairs very slowly and calmly, making contact with every step. It was a great session, the dogs were all so well behaved, they've done amazing. Train travel is essential, you know, for somebody who's visually impaired, it's going to be one of their main modes of transport, so it's really essential that the dogs are very comfortable in this whole environment and that they can get them safely from A to B. At Aracher and Tarbert, in the heart of the Trossachs National Park, Network Rail Geotech Engineers Alistair and Stewart are preparing to survey the open stretch of the West Highland Line. But this type of work requires meticulous forward planning. Understand the line is blocked between the station limit boards at Arakar. Return for 915 0915. Over. That's us now got a blockage of Arakar station and we can mount the machine on the track. Our colleagues have just taken an electronic token which allows us access to the line. So the premise is only one key exists at any one time and if you've got that key then you've got the key to the line and you're actually on the track and no other traffic can run into the section. So we'll be protected from the movement of trains by having that. To access the line, they're using a road rail vehicle. A truck modified with flange steel wheels so it can grip to the tracks. They've travelled to a section of the line that's under an increasing threat from the very rock upon which it sits. This lump of rock here used to be attached um, at a previous stage in time up there and it slid down the hillside. It's fractured and these fractures come right underneath the track and when that rock slowly moves open over time, um, and displaces, you get a loss of ballast, so we lose support effectively underneath the track and a hole opens up. In 2018, on this very spot, the ground opened up, exposing a void beneath the track. Rail services were halted immediately, while Stuart and the team came to investigate. What we've had to do is we filled in the hole and then we injected it with a polymer resin to bind all that material together and basically just re-establish support underneath the tracks. It's an area of constant movement. We know that this is, this is creeping very, very slowly. It's like your hair growing, you might not notice it, but um, in six months time it'll be, it'll be moved. So there's, um, there's a period of intensive maintenance through this section. The biggest fear for Alistair and Stuart is a train derailment like the incident that occurred along this line in 2010, when a large boulder derailed a two-car train and left the front carriage hanging over the road below. In an effort to avoid such a disaster, a sophisticated monitoring system has been installed on this vulnerable stretch of the line. We've got geometry monitors on the track which measure the movement of the rails and the sleepers and we've got a system of cameras set up at the site as well which are movement triggered and send images back that we can look at in the office and further on into the site we've got monitoring set up on the actual hillside itself on the rock slope. There is um, a concern that this large mass of rock could potentially slide or topple down towards the track so we've got monitoring on there just to pick up any movement. Using technology to monitor the terrain here is nothing new. Stuart and Alistair are heading a few miles down the line to check in a unique monitoring system in the shadow of the 1100 metre peak of Ben Crew. We've got a number of challenges through this section, mainly from falling boulders, from rocks and boulders which are high on the hillside and can roll down um, onto the railway. We've got a system which is a, a very old monitoring system. It was installed not long after the line was opened in the late 1800s. It's a series of 10 wires which are in tension. And the idea is that if a boulder was to come down the hillside, it would interact with those wires and snap one or more of them. 
which then detension the system and will drop one of the semaphore signals into the danger position. That then alerts the train driver approaching that there may be an obstruction on the line within that section. Installed in 1882, the system of trip wires is called Anderson's Piano, after its Victorian inventor, John Anderson. It's known as Anderson's Piano because the, the wires whistle in the wind and, and the tension on them are like tension piano wires. Um, so they make a kind of noise as the wind rustles through them. The wires stretch for over four miles along the line, with signals erected at quarter mile intervals. It has a listed status, so we need to preserve it. Um, I'm in awe of the mechanical nature of it all, you know, as an engineer that that is very pleasing to see, is that someone can come up with something, almost clockwork, and, yeah, really cutting edge of its day. And we try to be cutting edge of our day with some of the, the kit that we're installing on the railway now. Despite the advent of electronic monitoring, Anderson's piano still plays its part in track safety. And its survival is testament to the railway engineers, both past and present, who have been working to protect this magnificent line for over 120 years. Quite often, you, you, you kind of forget exactly where you are, you know, that you're in the, in, in the middle of all this fantastic scenery because you've got a job to do and you're, you're focusing on that job. But yeah, it is good to just take a few minutes and, and soak up the scenery and, and uh, try not to take it for granted. We are dead lucky, let's be honest. <laughs> it's a great job in a great location. In the heart of the Wild Highlands, railway adventurers Jeff and Vicky are on a 24-hour round trip from London to find out more about how the lines were developed here in the 19th century. So, uh, this is Carrower Station. Yeah. Over there? Yes. They've met up with Alan McLeod, head stalker for the Carrower Estate. John Sterling Maxwell bought the estate in the 1890s, and just at that time they were they were wanting to, to put the, the railway through Carrower Estate, and one of the conditions for them to do that was that they, they built the station, and it used to be uh, a private station purely for the estate. Would it, would it be like the rich and the nobility? Would they come up for weekends yeah. from London or something to go? Yeah, to go? all over London or Glasgow, you know, friends of Sir John Sterling Maxwell. Despite being the most remote station in the UK, these days Carrower is used by 20,000 people a year. We, uh, we're very busy with hill walkers and cyclists, and even over, over the winter, um, you get people, people skiing, fishermen as well, all these walks. As head stalker, Alan is responsible for managing the 57,000 acres of the Carrower Highland Estate on the edge of Rannoch Moor. But his family connection to the West Highland line stretches back over generations. My grandfather and great grandfather, they used to both work on the on the railway. My grandfather, he was a guard on the train, and my great grandfather, I think he used to look after the track, you know, ensure the maintenance. I've actually got quite a good photo of him uh, at first. Uh, he's beside the steam train and he's looking onto the, the hills of Carrower. It's quite interesting. I only found it a few years ago in a shoebox and they were cleaning out my granny's house. Oh, no way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Incredible. It's Jeff and Vicky's fourth visit to Carrower. But for them, this remote pocket of railway heritage has lost none of its charm. As I stepped onto the platform, I just I remember having a massive grin on my face because it's always it's always a delight to come here. I don't think I'll never not smile. It's always nice to come back. It feels familiar, and and yet we saw so many things today that we had have not seen before. It's a brilliant place. For now, it's time to say goodbye. Having spent the day in Fort William, the Caledonian sleeper has fired her engines for the 12-hour return journey to London. And Ricky is on hand to welcome them back on board the sleeper. Here comes trouble. Here we go. <laughs> Having fallen in love with this place over the years, what's the betting Jeff and Vicky will be back soon for visit number five? Bye. Until next time. <laughs>